Um, we're up to the bracha of Tekav Shofar. It's page 106 in, in the Art Scroll of English. This is understood as being a reference to the Pasuk in Yeshaya that talks about a prophecy talking about the end of days where the shofar will be blown and that will be the symbol for the ultimate redemption. Uh, if people remember last week, we discussed that the bracha about uh, Goel Yisrael, that God is the Redeemer of Israel, we discussed that it doesn't necessarily mean the ultimate redemption as much as redemption from times of difficulty. This bracha, which ends with Yisrael, that God will gather up uh, those who are spread out among Israel, this is the redemption. This is clearly the redemption. Um, by the way, what does the shofar gadol mean? So presumably the understanding of the shofar gadol is that it means this shofar will have, gadol means great, this shofar will have impact the world over. And that's what makes it the shofar gadol. So blow this shofar that will have great impact, l'cheiru seinu, for our freedom. Who's, who's in slavery exactly? What, what's the freedom for? What's that, what does that refer to? So the Rebar Yaakov gives two possibilities. Um, one is that famously we have an idea that people who are in slavery are freed in the Yovel year, in the Jubilee year, and the shofar is blown during Yom Kippur of the Jubilee year to signify that, that freedom. So he says that the idea here would be that we're kind of bound up by the nations of the world. In other words, we don't have the ability uh, to serve God how we would like to serve God. This doesn't necessarily mean that governments are stopping us from serving God, though that many times in our history has been the case, uh, that, that the, the places that we've lived have uh, created obstacles for us to serve God the way we want to. Uh, thank God, I'm very fortunate that that's not the case in, in our current time and place. But presumably, even in that context, it means that we, we were distracted by so many things that really don't have to do with with what we believe is really at our core that we're interested in. So the, the idea is that we know that the symbolism of a shofar for the ultimate redemption, and what we're doing in this pasuk is we're connecting that symbolism to another symbolism of freedom from slavery. And we, we, what we're saying is that when the shofar is blown, we'll find our true selves, essentially. That's, that's what we're asking of God. Um, there is a, a, a very interesting thing that Rebbe Yarko also says is a possibility, which is this could be another reference to the revival of the dead. In other words, that they're, they're freed from their bound, bondage, in other words, that they're, they're, they're buried underground, and now they're free. Just an interest, which of course we're also taught that that will happen at the end of days, that, that, that they'll be revived, so that's an interesting thing. Well, you know, if you don't mind, we'll just at the, at the end of each of us. Thank you. Visa nes lekabets galuyo seinu. And raise up a banner to gather all of those who have been exiled. Uh, Rav Schwab just makes a point over here that part of the request is we ask God that it should be abundantly clear to the entire world that whatever is happening to us at that juncture is the divine hand. Which, of course, we talk about that in so many contexts, that on that day it will be Hashem Echad, Shua Echad, that it will be apparent that, that, that God is one. V'kapseinu yachad me'arba kanfos aretz. And gather us together from the four corners of the earth. What does that mean? So it clearly means that people are spread, the Jewish people are spread all around the world, and then when the ultimate redemption comes, you know, from north, south, east, west, we'll all come to Israel. But Rav Schwab suggests that it means a little bit more in addition to that, which is, and this is a great thing for us to daven for, we should be yachad. We should be together. Not only gather together in physicality, that we're all physically in the same place, but we should be gathered together in spirit. And uh, I think we would all agree that, that, that that's going to be some mean trick. Um, <laughs> but, um, but we believe it. <laughs> we believe that it's possible. Uh, um, an, interesting, uh, an interesting point, the language of Arba Kanfosa Oretz, uh, the four corners of the land uh, is also a reference to a verse. It's, it's a reference to a verse in Yeshai. It's actually cited uh, in the art school for those following along. Um, Rav Schwab makes a point here. So kanaf means a corner, right? We, when, the, when the Torah talks about tzitzis, it talks about kanfei, they have the corners of the garments. But there's another meaning of kanaf, which is a wing. So he suggests that the hope is 
that the clarity of God in this world that gathers the Jewish people from all the world over, all to one place. And as we mentioned already, that the hope is that the nations of the world will see this and understand it as being the clear hand of God. It's somewhat of a play on words, but one could suggest that it has a way of elevating the entire world. It's like, like a wing elevates something. It's a very interesting thing to think about. Definitely not shot. Definitely not, uh, definitely not the straightforward meaning, but it's, it's just a nice thing to think about. And then we, we end the bracha, Baruch Atu Hashem, Mikabeitz Nidchei Amo Yisrael, who gathers up, Nidachim, our people pushed away. That he should gather up the, those of his nation, Israel, who are pushed away. And it's an interesting thing. We say these words all the time. The word is a little bit interesting. I mean, there is a passage also that talks about Nidachim, but it doesn't just say he gathered those who are exiled. It says he gathers those that are pushed away. So Rav Schwab suggests that it could be an additional meaning that not only should Klai Israel be united, not only should everyone be brought to the same place, not only should we all be united in spirit, but there are so many Jewish souls that really are, are not connected right now. Uh, at least in a, in a conscious way, to our faith. And honestly, many of these souls feel that they have been pushed away. Maybe it's perceived, whatever it is, sometimes it's justified. I mean, if people feel that way, it's always justified, but I'm saying sometimes, sometimes it's more imagined, sometimes it's less imagined. But that God should gather up, that part of the ultimate redemption is not only that physically everybody comes to the same place, <coughs> Not only that spiritually we're all of, of, of the same mind, but even those people who have found themselves to be distanced from Judaism should also be brought back yeah, together. Yeah, it's just a nice thing uh, to think about. But this is the bracha uh, of the redemption. Any comments? Well, you were talking about revival of the dead, but we already did mechanism. Yeah, 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 yeah. In other words, well, but it's interesting. Um, I mean, the standard shot is first the slavery that we, you know, we can kind of find our, our true selves. Um, his, rec his suggestion would be that there's an additional allusion to it. But you're right. I mean, this is the, the main Mechaim Mason. Yeah, absolutely. Though I do want to point out that was not a request there. Yes. That was uh, just showing the might of God. This is a request. So it's a little bit different. Yeah. Yes, Max. The reference to, um, to the banner. Uh, is a reference to something we're reading about, which is that the, the, the Bene Israel are going through the desert. They have banners. Yeah. And so it's a banner as opposed to multiple banners for yes. different tribes. Yes, that's a very interesting point. Thank you very much. I mean, we could spend a lot, a long time talking about this imagery. Um, don't worry, that's not a threat. Um, but, but, uh, um, but I think the point here is this banner is actually not as much about us but about God. In other words, it's God's banner. I think it's figuratively speaking, but it's God's banner, so to say. So whereas in the desert, it's, and there are beautiful Midrashim that talk about the tremendous emphasis of the different flags and the different shvatim, the tribes, that speaks to who we are as people, the, the variation within the tribe. This seems to be one, by the way, it fits with the idea of bring us all together, uh, in, together in all ways, but, but, but the idea of it seems to be the banner of God. And that, that I suppose that's the singular. I suppose it's an interesting point. Thank you. Aaron? This is going a little into the world of the Midrash, but the juxtaposition of the Shofar Gadol and the Chay Hussein might be referenced to like Parsina, where you had the Shofar Gadol and you had the Midrash that says, you know, the writing was engraved on the, on the tablets, really don't read it. Kadol's Chay were, were actually free through the Torah. So maybe the Torah is, is part of this, meaning, meaning the freedom brought on by, by the Torah. And it's the whole yeah, I think that's a very nice point. Thank you very much. Um, there's actually a morale that I, I like to quote, and I, I, I somehow fought the urge to say it now, but now you've, you've, you've you know, now you egged me on. So um, um, the morale says that the shofar is an instrument that only makes a sound based on our breath. So the breath is something that you can't see, and it's a hidden thing that's brought out. And he says that every time there's a significance of the shofar being blown, so. Har Sinai is this revelation to the world that the world didn't appreciate until that moment. Uh, the ultimate redemption, 
is, is you know, again, something that people don't even perceive. Hashem achad, achad. So I, I think it's a very nice, uh, thank you very much. I, I particularly appreciate you bringing something up that I had a, that I had a shock to share about. <laughs> thank you, thank you very much. Maybe Leah's yeah, comment on yeah. this bracha, yes. Uh, obviously the word nice also means miracle, so is there some interpretation besides banner that, that this, uh, that kibbutz kaliyot will happen in a miraculous way? I, I don't I don't know I mean it certainly makes sense it certainly follows uh, if if it's funny the, the the words banner and miracle are not that different because if it's an obvious miracle that is a banner um, I, I think that's very fair that the nation of the world will recognize um, that this is the hand of God so I, I think it's fair to look at it that way but Arts will translate it as banner, so that must be the only way to. Um, uh, but I, I, but but I think it's a very similar point. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, uh, let's go on to the next bracha. Hashiva shoftenu kvarishona. Bring back our judges, like was originally. Um, the mafreshim explained. It, it actually is, is very appropriate. Uh, from the first chapter of Yeshaya, which is uh, some of the half Torahs during this, this time of year, um, there's a pasuk that talks about that God will redeem us, redeem us, and then it says, "Va'ashiva shoftayich to Rishona," and I will bring back your judges like I originally had. So the previous bracha spoke about the redemption, and now this bracha <laughs> speaks about the fact that God should bring our judges back as. Uh, as was before. Um, now, I don't know if, if anyone thought about this. My guess is in this group people certainly did. It's a really interesting thing. This is the second bracha that started this way, more or less. Right? Um, two pages ago, we have a bracha on 102 in the art school in English. God, bring us back to your Torah. And now it's not the same words, but it's striking that it's the same root. Hashiva Shoftenik Varishona, bring back our judges like was original. So it's interesting, what's the, is it just a coincidence? You know, like there must be some intent there, presumably. So Rav Schwab makes the point, I, I think it's a, there's personal tshuva, there's personal coming back, and there's communal coming back. And those are two different requests. So the bracha earlier is inspire each and every one of us as people to come back in a more, in a more connected way to God and Judaism, etc. This bracha is now that there's a redemption, help us as a community, again, more than just the sum of the parts, but at, at a communal level, help us communally gain more clarity in our service of God. So, Hashiva Shoftenu Kvarishona, bring back our judges like we're originally, and bring back our advisors, our counselors, as we used to have. So, these seem to be both people to guide us as to what the halacha is, um, and also people to kind of be more mentors. It sounds like there's kind of two points here. One is more like technical guidance, and one seems to be more being role models and things of that sort, advice. So, you know, God, help us, help us get back to how we used to be in terms of the stellar leadership that Israel used to have. Vasir menu yagon ranacha. And remove from us, I'm curious, uh, he says, sorrow and groan. That's how the translation here in the arts grow. It is interesting, Rav Schwab says that yagon is a language of internal distress and despair. And anacha, anacha literally means to groan. So it's like when one overflows with that, then they reach anacha. You know, that's, you imagine, sometimes you see it, right? Or we have it sometimes in our lives, that we're so overburdened by whatever our problems are at the moment that just, not even to express anything, but just to ourselves. We just say, oh, you know, kind of groan. So yagon is the in internal feeling, and anacha is where it becomes so strong that, that we express it with, like a groan. So bring us, bring us back these judges, bring us back these advisors, and remove from us distress and despair. What distress and despair is being removed from us if we bring back the judges? Like, what, what exactly is the point here? It's a very interesting Rabbi Nebuchadnezzar. Rabbi Nebuchadnezzar says, you might think that the distress is when people don't have clarity as to what the right thing to do is. Right? In other words, gosh, you know, I, I, 
the, there's not clarity in our judges like there used to be. You know, you call this one, he tells you one thing, you call that one, he tells you something else. You know, five different, uh, you know, and, and my neighbor does something different, it's so frustrating. God, bring us back uh, the clear leadership like we used to have, and then everything will be great. He says, that's not the shot. that's not the intention here. Rather, what the intention is, is one of the greatest sources of our distress in life is when we don't have clarity as to the path ahead, as to what we're supposed to be doing with ourselves. And, uh, you, you know, uh, we, we, there's a famous quote like this, um, Ein simcha kataras hasfekos. Uh, there's no joy like the resolution of doubts. So when we don't have uh, the top, top quality uh, leadership, so many questions in our life. I mean, obviously, some questions will always remain, but, but there's so many questions that don't have to be that we just don't have clarity about. And when we don't have clarity, we have so much distress and despair. And so we, we ask God, bring us back leaders like we, have, like we haven't had for a long time, and by extension, we'll be people of greater joy. It's, 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 an, interesting, it's an interesting thing to think about. Um cholenu, <laughs> and you, God, should rule over us alone, by yourself, with kindness and with compassion. So first of all, the Rebbe Yerker explains that the significance of saying that God should rule over us alone is it's like the famous Pasuk, that on that day when the ultimate redemption comes, God will be one and he'll be understood as being. So let it be clear to us that you alone rule. And you should rule with kindness. Now isn't that interesting? The beginning of the bracha is talking about bringing back judges. <coughs> so why, does, why is the request of God, bring us back judges and then you be nice to us? You know, chesed is, is, is a beautiful midah, but it doesn't fit so well with being a judge. So um, the Reba Yakar cites, cites a... Medrash Tan Chuma in Parshas Breshis. It says in the Pasuk, Lo Yodon Ruchi Vadon Leolam. God says this is right before the flood. Um, God says, My spirit will not judge man forever. Now there's a context of that Pasuk there, but just in a vacuum, that's what the words mean. And the Medrash says a very interesting thing. If people of our world deal with justice, if we have justice within our society, so God says, I, I don't have to treat them with so much justice. I, I can look to them more with compassion because there's a justice system internally within the society. But if they're not going to have justice, if they're going to run roughshod over each other and there's no clarity and it's, 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 a, it's a shook, it's, it's, it's all over the place, so then how can I deal with them with compassion? I have to have a firm hand. So therefore, the Rebbe Yerker says that's the intent here in this bracha. That we tell God, we ask God, please bring back judges like we've had before, and so then you can look at us with mercy. It's just an interesting, interesting thought. Um, by the way, I don't know if anyone's wondering what, what's the difference between chesed, kindness, and racham and mercy. So Rav Schwab suggests uh, the way he understood an earlier bracha is that chesed referred to kindness of things of this world, and racham referred to the ultimate compassion of bringing people back, bringing people back from the dead. So he suggests that might be what's going on here also. In other words, chesed, treat us with kindness, and ultimately give us the ultimate kindness, which is to bring back those who have, have left this world. Vitzad keinu bamishpat. And make us just in justice. Baruch atu Hashem, Melech Oheb Stakal Mishpat. God who loves righteousness and judgment. Um, the word tzedek and mishpat also are kind of interesting how they, how they coincide together. Mishpat is justice, certainly. Tzedek does mean justice, but we also have another association with tzedek, which is staka, which certainly has some type of connotation as being kindness. By the way, um, the way it's traditionally understood, why does tzedek mean charity, or tzedakah, why does that mean charity? So the way it's normally understood is if I really believe in God, then I, I'm compelled to say that if I have more money, 
than I need for myself, and you know, then it makes sense that God is giving me this money to help someone who needs it. You know, so in other words, it's, it's actually, it's really, it's not, it's on a sense, in a sense, it's not really what we think of as stuck. It really is mishpah. It really is appropriate. In other words, it's not that I'm such a nice person, it's that I'm doing what's right. And that, that, that's what charity is. But it's interesting, even in that context, so staka means justice, but with, with, with a sympathetic, with a compassionate twist. And Rav Schwab suggests that's what we mean when we talk about tzedek and mishpat. That yes, God judges us. God definitely does judge us, but we ask that he judge us with tzedek. Meaning he looks at us with a little bit of understanding. You know, I'll, 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 give, you, um, I'll give you an example. We, we all have our strengths and we all have our weaknesses. So it, it's not reasonable for us to expect that when we do something wrong that God should just overlook it. That's not, that's not reasonable unless we repent, but with absolute repentance, we don't believe that God just overlooks our shortcomings. We do hope that God understands that maybe that's a shortcoming of ours because it just happens to be a unique challenge that we have. And maybe it'll, he'll judge it differently with us than with someone else because maybe, hopefully, he'll understand this unique challenge for us. So that's judging, but that's judging with sort of a <coughs> twist of compassion. Um, so, Satkenu <coughs> Bamishpat Asid, the truth is the article translates it as justify us through judgment, which really fits very well with what we're saying. In other words, kind of look at us in a, in a sympathetic way, but still judge us. So, in the end of the day, just to summarize what we're talking about with this bracha, we ask God to bring our judges and our leaders as they've been. Uh, our lives will fundamentally be different when that happens. And ironically, the way God relates to us can be different. The more justice we have in society, ironically, the more kindness he can extend towards us. So that, that's really what we're asking for in this bracha. Any comments? Um, Yeah, so I, I, yeah, I mean, it's, it's just, I just want to repeat the, right, I mean, just to repeat the question, thank you very much. So, during the 10 days of repentance, we shift the bracha to Melech Ohev Stakal Mishpat, God loves righteousness and judgment, just HaMelech HaMishpat, the God of judgment. I, the way I always understood it is, you know, like we've said other times in this series, part of tefillah is we're talking to ourselves to help us think through things the right way, during the Yom Noroyim, during the days of Oa, we need to recognize that uh, we got to get serious here. So it, it's might possibly during a certain time of year, it's not the best thing for us to say to God, you know, we, we hope you'll kind of look the other way a little bit or, or look at us with Brahmans. I mean, we say that in other contexts, but it's not the worst thing that when we get to this brothel, we just, we look at you as the God of judgment. And we understand that that's what's going on during this period. I think that's so it's a greater emphasis. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I, I think they're... we're You please add. Uh, yeah. please, please. I thought there were, there were three subjects. Uh, you talked about two being the first thing, uh, bring back our judges. And then we talk about Pachorico. But I think that the subject of the bracha itself is us. It says God loves he doesn't love it in himself. He must love it in in um, in the people. So from that, as a idea of Tishba coming up, it says that if we um, judge people uh, kindly, right. we will be judged kindly. If we and there's an issue of prayer, if we pray for others, and we also have this affliction then God will be more attuned to helping us with our own affliction as we pray for somebody else. Great. So. Thank you, Fred. It's very nice. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, Thank okay. you. Um, Rabbi Sachs, who is sitting here on Hosein uh, Menu Yogavanacha, says, um, he moves to Sar uh, Sarum and Sain. This is, this is the plaint of people who have known the full precariousness of being dependent on the goodwill of others. There's something very ironic in terms of the Bible. 
about asking for the restoration of the judges that had the first as at the beginning. He was, I mean, if not over and over again, tells us that that period, a lot of bad things happened because there was no case. There's only judges and people didn't follow the judges. You're asking for restoration. You know, it's but that is the language of the Nevoah. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's the language of the Nevoah yeah, also. But right. it's ironic because uh, it's combined with, <coughs> excuse me, restoring the judges and then you, God, rule us alone. Sounds like we don't want another king, just you. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, the aspiration of the Messianic God is there will be a member of the king. Right. 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 It's interesting. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Maybe last comment on this question. Uh, the earlier comment talks about uh, the, the Pekar Shofar. It, it's, it's an allusion to, uh, to the Jewish people coming back to Israel. Uh, to be uh, a Zionistic uh, statement. And the next one refers to having uh, uh, it's being run in a halakhic way or having it run Jewishly. Uh, but the, the, the allusion, notwithstanding David's comment to, to judges, could be seen not only just the, the time of the judges, but also how Jesuit was supposed to be inspired and he'd be a conduit for God's, for God's message. So there is, there, there, is, there is no disconnect that uh, you're supposed to go to the judges of your time if they're inspired as they were many years ago right. um, and they were, had the women with women, maybe they also were inspired in different ways to give back ultimate the justice that we can uh, refer to. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, let's go on to the next bracha. Um, the next bracha is a very famous bracha. It's um, the, 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 the 19th bracha of Shmona Esrei, <laughs> which means 18. Uh, so th this was uh, famously added during the times of Rabban Gamliel. It's interesting, the Gemara talks about that it was added during the times of Rabban Gamliel. Um, I'm, not, I'm not joking, but I say this, there actually were two Rabban Gamliels who lived at two different times. So it's a little bit of a question as to which Rebbe Gamliel we're talking about. Uh, it was either the, the end of the Second Temple or after the destruction of the Second Temple, depending on which generation you're talking about. But the bottom line is, it is a reference to um, Apikorsim, uh, heretics. Um, there, there's definitely, um, there's definitely references in many of the commentaries to uh, the beginnings of Christianity uh, and the attempt by individuals to try to shift the Jewish model. In other words, that was really the concern. The concern was that there were people in Klal Israel who were uh, kind of uh, enemies from the inside, so to say, in, in terms of uh, they, were, they were preaching uh, a different and living uh, a different belief system than is what was understood to be Judaism. Um, so much so that when this bracha was instituted, this was somewhat of a litmus test when someone davened Chazar as a shatz, when someone was a chazan, and he, and he repeated the Shemona Esrei out loud, they, they kind of would see if, if he would hem and haw when he got to this bracha. Because there were, there were people sitting there in Shul who this bracha was all about them. I mean, that, that, that's the bottom line. Uh, so they, they were times where they would weed someone out in that way. Uh, very dramatic times in classroom. I don't think we can fully relate uh, to the challenges of, of the time. It was a very unique time. Um, well, there are plenty of Malshim even nowadays. They may not be within, in there without and following um, Max's thing. If you're talking about, you know, um, there, there should be people as Kaleo to... Um, to Israel, and there should and the, and it, Israel needs to establish uh, shof team and um, yawat seen properly, and then we ask God to um, uh, give no hope to all those people who are bad mouthing Israel and bad mouthing the Jewish people today. Thank you, thank you. Um, the the initial advent of the bracha was with this in mind. Um, there is, by the way, just to flow with this pasuk that we keep on referring to from Yeshaya, so it talks about the redemption, then it says, I'll bring back your judges like were originally, that was the last bracha, and then there's another phrase there which says, that I will refine uh, your metal, in other words, meaning that I will kind of help eliminate the impurities among your people. So that's, we, 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 we fit this in 
to that to that process. Again, we're speaking in very very strong terms over here. Um, the Rebar Yoker poses a question. I thought we're not supposed to daven that bad things happen to people. That's a pretty strong bracha. It's a pretty strong bracha. Um, he makes two points. One point that he makes is that if you look closely at the bracha, you could argue that it's more about removing good from people. But then there's a second point that, that's very important. There's a famous Gemara and Brachos about the mayor. And people? Let me, let, if you don't mind, let me just speak. It's, okay. Um, there's a second, there's a Gemara and Brachos um, about Remeyer and Bruria. Uh, famously, that there were people who were giving Remeyer a very difficult time. And uh, he davened that they should, they should die. He davened that, that God should get rid of them. And his wife, Bruria, gave him Mosar, gave him rebuke, and said, um, it says in the Pasuk, it's from Baruch Inashu, Sam Rosh Chodesh, Yitamu Chatoim in Haaretz, that sins should be eradicated from the world. It doesn't say sinners should be eradicated from the world, it says sins should be eradicated from the world. So the Reba Yerker suggests that part of the intent of this bracha is that people doing evil should stop doing evil. But bottom line is, whether you say that people doing evil should start doing evil, or that God should eradicate the people who are doing evil, I mean, either way, it's a pretty strong brother. That's, uh, that didn't seem that played well to the crowd from the facial expressions, but okay. Um, okay, in any event. Uh, to those, and again, Maushin is literally a slanderer, um, in, as, as has been mentioned, and it's a a worthwhile point. Uh, we, we have to deal with a lot of ill things said about our people today. Um, presumably, the more traditional meaning of Malshinim, though it's something worthwhile to think about, but presumably the more traditional meaning of Malshinim is people living among the Jews who would speak, uh, you know, kind of reminiscent of the end of the story of Kamsa Bar Kamsa. You know, the person wanted to do in the Jews, so he went to the Caesar and, you know, he said the Jews are against you. There should be no hope for those individuals. The Chol Harisha Kiregatoved. And all of wickedness, by the way, that, that's the meaning of the word, all wickedness should instantaneously be destroyed. The Chol Ayvecha Me And all of your enemies, there's a little bit harder, all of your enemies should be uh, quickly annihilated. Vazidim Mehira. And the Zaydim. Now, there's a really interesting thing here about Zaydim. The, the, presumably the meaning of Zaydim is something along the lines of wanton, wanton enemies. Uh, I'm curious what they translated it as. Um, wanton sinners. Thank you. So up until now, we were talking about people who are our enemies because they said ill about us, people who are enemies of God. Where does sinners come into this exactly? So actually, what Schwab suggests that we're talking about a different segment of people now. Up until now, we're talking about people who try to cause the destruction of the Jewish people. Now we can talk about people who try to cause the spiritual destruction of the Jewish people. We can relate to that also. It's in our neighborhood, in our day, you have, you have uh, you know, Jews for J wandering from door to door. But we have that challenge today also, people trying to confuse the faith of, of our nation. So, in any event, he says, he suggests that Zayden, the language of sinners, refers to people trying to negatively impact the spirituality of the Jewish people. And the, the verbs here are very interesting. You should quickly takir, ushaber, usmager, v'sachnia. These are four different verbs for some type of eradication. Why are there four different verbs? Takir means to uproot. So Shaber means to break. Smager means to like completely destroy. Sachnia means to humble. Um, Rav, Rav, Rav Schwab does make a nuance between these four. He says takir means, you know, a root when you're okay, you know, to detach it from the ground. So he says, help that whoever is trying to damage us 
should not continue to grow. In other words, they shouldn't continue to flourish. That's not here. To shaper means break them in the sense that let them splinter off into groups as opposed to being one united front. Tzmagir, he suggests then take those groups and break them further just into individuals as opposed to larger groups. And Sachni ultimately humble them. In other words, kind of you know, cut, them, cut them down uh, to size. Um, yamein, speedily in our, in our day, Baruch atu Hashem, she'ovir oivim u'machni azeitim. The uh, God is the one who breaks the enemies and humbles the sinners. And again, Rav Shuaf suggests we talk about two different people. There. One is the physical enemies of Cloud Israel. We're fine with them being broken, right? We can make long lists of who this could be talking about today, unfortunately. And then there are those who try to make Cloud Israel uh, confused in their service of God. Those people should be humbled. You know, they don't really have to be broken. They should. They just need to be stopped. That's a different, different type of. Uh, okay. Comments, questions, motion. Um, first of all, she, uh, I think that's kind of an answer to what you were saying before. Uh, you know, how can we dominate for somebody to be, you know, um, injured or anything? So say, or down. I, I'm not hearing you well. I'm sorry. Uh, the, 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 the term Malshinim, I think you could apply that to somebody who, who, who slams Jewish people in the sense that he, um, reports them to the government or something, so they might have to deal with the road is. So in that case, I think it would make sense that you'd be able to tell them for, for them specifically for something bad to happen to them. I mean, if you could kill her, you know, I can imagine that would be. I think that's a I think that's a very good point. I think that's a very good point. There are there are scenarios. There are scenarios that, that there are that there are people who who uh, lose their halachic status as, as as being one of us. That that that's true. Yes. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you very much. Did you want to say something? Did you want to say something? You, I, I think you Did I misspeak? You, you misspoke. I'm sorry. Okay. You said to take out good. You meant to take out evil. Oh, okay. At least that's Does it mean the same thing? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. I apologize. Thank you very much. Didn't the Thanks for listening. <laughs> didn't the wording of this uh, blessing change over time? Wasn't it specifically... Word for Mubarak at the beginning? Yeah, there have, there have been, um, I think of all the brachos, my understanding is this bracha probably there has been the biggest changes over time. Uh, there, there are a lot of variations from the original language. Uh, there were reference to Mubarak. Yes, thank you, which is Abi Kors and Heretics. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I believe that Shmuel Katan uh, was the author of the prayer and goes along with something you said earlier that um, there's different thoughts. Are we trying to get rid of evil? Well, Shmuel HaKatan was chosen specifically so that he did not have any <coughs> animus to anybody. Right. Right. So his prayer would be one of love, right. and however he did it, not with any anger. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. That's very good my point. Thank you. Yeah, last, uh, Max, you always, you know, pull up the rear here. Yeah, it was, uh, <laughs> Sorry, no, it's good. A, a, a comment and, and, and question. The question is, why is it considered a blessing? It sounds like a curse. Okay, that's a wonderful, it's a wonderful comment. Uh, let me let me repeat I it. Have a comment also. That's oh, that that's a wonderful question. That's a wonderful question. Um, let me clarify something to you, man. If I don't know the answer, it's a comment. If I do know the answer, it's a question. Um, it is true. It, it, it is. It is true that we refer to these as blessings. In 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 in, in many respects, um, I, I think in general, blessings is not such a good translation for what we're doing here. Um, what at its core, this is probably something we should have spoke about at the very beginning. At its core, a bracha means that we recognize that God is the source of abundance. And we recognize that God is the source of all. Uh, many, many commentators uh, make a connection to a, a brecha. Brecha is like, like a pool or a spring. <coughs> you know, it's a, something, a, a source of a water for a, a place that the water flows into. Uh, so we recognize that God is the source of all. And because uh, he always said, what does it mean we're blessing God? What does that mean anyway? So in the context of recognizing that God is the source of all, we make requests of him. So sometimes we have general praise of him, which is what we do at the beginning of Shimon Hesper, which is we just recognize, wow, you really are the source of everything in our, in our lives on a, on a broad level. And then these brachos in the middle of Shimon Hesper are very specific 
requests, but the request is fashioned with the understanding that you are the source. In other words, if anybody is going to destroy our enemies, it's going to be you. So you are the source of abundance in that regard, too. The comment has to do with the amount of, of passion and violence in the terms that, that, you, that you took apart. A poor smash cast down and humble is translation in the article. It almost refers to uh, uh, almost original sin or Yesahara. You have to find it, it's all over the place and you have a different ways to combat it. So it has a, a sense of pervasiveness and, and uh, it's always going to be this way. Very interesting. I mean, again, and it fits very well with Rav Schwab's comment that at this juncture we're actually talking about people who are trying to confuse us more than destroy us. And uh, there are always new challenges in their regard. Unfortunately, there are always new challenges to people trying to destroy us. But in a way, the, the confusion um, creates a more varied uh, danger and fear, in, in a sense. Yeah. You know, um, OK, one more. Nancy. Yeah. Just I wanted to say, Max, any blessing can also be a curse, and any curse can be a blessing. Because if somebody's trying to kill me, and Hashem somehow makes it happen that I don't get killed, it is a wonderful blessing for me. But the person who got, you know, Slapped down and perhaps killed before they could hurt me, it's not a blessing for them. It's a curse for them. So a lot of this is on perspective. <laughs> we're asking for, for the Jewish people, for us. So we're asking for his blessing and his protection on us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great, great. The question is, if, if, why isn't it all the way at the end? So presumably, it fits in with that flow, like this Pesach and Mishai that we're talking about, um, that part of the ultimate redemption, part of the bringing of, just, of judgment, is the, uh, our, uh, the impurities within our people will, will be eradicated. And that, that, that seems to fit in over here. I think there's also a practical thing. I think if it would just be stuck at the end of Shmona Ezra, right, probably wouldn't be given uh, the same type. I mean, here's the problem. You're not going to put it at the very end of Shmona Ezra, right, because the very end of Shmona is actually not requests. Um, the last bracha of the middle section of Shmona Ezra is Shema Koleinu. You should, you should hear our prayers, which is clearly the closing bracha of the section. So, so then the question is, you know, you're going to stick it in somewhere. So you could have <coughs> the last bracha before Shema Koleinu, but there seems to be other logical reasons why it come in here. Thank you. Okay, uh, let's move on. Al Kim. Al Kim Viala Chasidim. On the pious ones uh, and uh, righteous about. Uh, there are there are uh, different uh, approaches and unfortunately for, for the nuance in Sadikim and Chasidim. The normal connotation of tzaddikim are people who, you know, the people we really resent, the people who do everything right. Um, <laughs> you know, related, related to the word we were saying before about tzaddik, and that's everything that they do is just. Um, chasidim, this is not a reference to chasidim versus misnagdim, let me clarify. Um, chasidim, two things. Chasidim could have a, a connotation of people who do like Lefnim Mishur HaSadin, above the letter of the law. But truth be told, the more traditional approach in the commentators of what Hasidim refers to is Bali Chuba, people who, who have repented to God. In a sense, there's a certain strength of the spirit. And again, I don't necessarily, we, we do such funny things today. We classify everyone in categories. You know, what category are you? Are you this? Are you that? We all need to be Bali Shuva. There's a famous story, I'm sure many of you know the story. Uh, somebody, somebody once went to a rabbi in Israel and he asked him, like, you know, what yeshiva do you study in? So he told him, you know, he's, I study in uh, a certain yeshiva that's known as a place for Bali Shuva to study, but they also have a regular, you know, not a beginner section. He said, but I'm not about Shuva. And the rabbi said to him, why not? <laughs> you know, so, so it's, um, we all need to be Bali Shuva. So the tzaddikim are the people who are perfect to begin with. Tzadikim does not mean FFPs, let me clarify. Uh, tzadikim means, means the people who are, are, are perfect to begin with. Chasidim are the people who are uniquely pious in their own way that they've really improved over time. That's, that's a very unique piety, regardless of one's background. 
Al Tzadikim Bial Hasidim, and there are also verses cited on the beginning of this bracha that talk about God's um, you, a strong inclination to listen to the prayers of a tzaddik and or a chassid. So by chassidim, there's a pasuk that yispala lelecha chassid laismet. So that, that a pious person should daven to you at, 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 at a time to, to where it's found to be appropriate. And there's a very famous pasuk by tzaddikim that was so famous that I said to myself, I don't even have to write it down because it's such an obvious pasuk and now I'm blanking on it. <laughs> but I, I believe it's one of the pasukim from Ashrei. It talks about God listening to the prayers of the, right, the tzaddikim. Anyone? What? No, 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 it's tzaddikim. Uh, there's a tzaddik, uh, whatever, I'm sorry. Uh, I'll try to have it for next time. Uh, okay. Um, um, in which question? No, I'm, I'm, no. Yeah, but it's not. It's not. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And on the elders of your nation, Israel. It's very interesting. The Rebbe Yaakov says this is not. This is not a reference to age. This is not even, sometimes Canaan is a reference to like Torah scholarship. It's not that either. He says this specifically refers to um, people in public positions in Cloud Israel. That's what the Rebbe Yaakov says. Um, on, on, so literally it translates elders, but it means people in, in positions of responsibility among the nation. Vial pleitas sofrehem, and on the remnant of their scholars, this, this refers to Torah scholars within Israel, the al Tzedek, extremely powerful, they had uh, converts, the righteous convert gets their own focus here in this bracha, the al and upon us. You know, there's all this distinguished list, Tzadikim, Chasidim, Zignayamcha, Pleita Sofreyam, Geirei Tzedek, and then the other 99%, and that, that's, that's the rest of us. Yamura Hamecha Hashem Elokeinu. On all of these people, your, your mercy uh, should manifest itself, God. V'sein sachar tov l'chol ha-botchim m'shimcha b'emes. And give a, a, a good reward, a generous reward, to all of those who have faith in your name, in truth. So I just want to a classic approach in the commentators here it, is that they have faith that your name is true. I, I, I don't know about any of you, many times I look at this book, I think, oh, maybe it means the people who, who are the real deal. Both can b'shem chob emes, you know, like they have faith in your name, really. The, I saw somebody say something like that, but that's not the traditional approach. The traditional approach is, both can b'shem chob emes, they have faith in your name, in the absolute truth of your name. That's, so people who have faith, full faith in God, Vesim chalkeinu imohem niolam. Place our lot with them forever. This is a fascinating statement. You know, we, we've spoken so much about the Baruch of Shemar being in the plural. It's a fascinating statement about how we need to view ourselves among the nation. We look out and we see great people all around us. And, and we, we need to connect in some way to that. It's not that far till the, 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 the Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur season. There's a famous thought from Rabbi Israel Salanter. Israel Salanter says that one of the greatest merits that a person can have for Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur is to be needed in some way within the community. Um, you know, that, that listen, what, what are my merits already? But there are all these people around me who have great merits, and, and the community as a whole has great merits. I need to be needed within that community, and then that, that gives me a whole new set of merits. Um, so, v'sim chalkinu v'mehem ni'olam v'lo nevosh. Again, the traditional approach of the commentators is to put a comma here. V'lo nevosh. We should not be ashamed. We should not be ashamed in our deeds. We should conduct, you should help us conduct ourselves in a way that we have nothing to be ashamed of. You should help us do the right things. Presumably the implication is you should help us learn from the people around us to do the right things. <coughs> Hold on, let me just let me just finish that if you don't mind. Ki because 
All of this we ask because we have faith in you. We just ask that because of our faith in you, you should help us in all these regards. Baruch Atu Hashem, Mishan, whom we've talked about Tzadikim. Mishan is like a support, and Miftach, he translates here as, as assurance for the righteous. The Rebbe Yarker says that a Mishan is someone who people have faith in. A Mishan literally can be something that you lean on, literally. And Miftach, you have numerous verses that talk about people praying to God because of placing their faith in Him, placing their Miftacho, you know, placing their Bitachon. So Miftach is traditionally associated with prayer. So it's interesting, it's two different statements. So the pious rely on God. How many times in the history of the Jewish people have we not known how in the world we're going to handle a situation? We just shrug our shoulders as a nation. We say, we just have to turn to God and, and hope that he helps us. That's Mishan, that's God as, as a support. Miftach is specifically the focus of our prayers. Um, and so basically this bracha is asking God to to be, a, to, to, in a sense, justify, not a good word choice, but justify uh, the faith that Klal Israel has in him. Not really justify, but the point is, we, we, should, we should turn to you, you should always look at all of us, our, our more distinguished members, and who knows, by the way, who's more distinguished, who's less distinguished, only God knows, our greater ones, and those not as great, but you should look at us as all one people, and you, we should always be rewarded for our faith in you. Um, if I could just say one thing, and then we'll open up to, to comments. Uh, I, it's just, in a sense, this is a bracha about Amuna a little bit. It just always it goes, it's worthy of note. Amuna faith is not that I believe it's going to turn out okay. A lot of times in our history, it hasn't turned out so okay. Amuna is, I believe, whatever is happening is happening for a reason. That, that, that's what Amuna is, and I believe it's in, it's in God's hands. And, and that doesn't mean that if I pray, I'm going to get the desired result, because God knows a lot more than we do. But what it does mean is that there's a reason to pray. And regardless of whether or not our prayers are answered, there's a certain consolation and belief that it happened for a reason, whether or not we'll ever understand that reason. That's just a very important thing to reflect on. Debbie, did you want to say something? Do you want the pasuk still? Yes, please. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think there's another one. That's maybe not. Maybe, maybe it's not from Ashray. I saw, I'll believe it or I'll, I'll bring it to you next time. I saw the Pasuk. Oh, this is such a, I don't even need to write this down. This is such a famous Pasuk. That one works for what you were trying to say. Yeah, but it's, it's not about us. It's about, it's about, I, there's another one. I have to find it. I guess it's not from Ashray. Thank you. And any other comments, questions? This is a, such a contrast to the preceding one, which is the 19th, which is inserted, that I, I have to wonder, how would we have understood it if we didn't have La Machine ahead of it? Well, yeah. How was it understood before we added the 19th one? And is there a historical development of it that parallels the historical development you know, it, it's a very interesting comment. I, I think there's. It all, a, oh, excuse me. It also explains why why was Malmach even put here? In the yes. Contract yes. I think that's very true. Um, it's it's actually it's a fascinating statement. The way we're supposed to look at the Jewish people. I mean, this you were talking about the three weeks before. I mean, this is worthy of all of us to reflect on in this time of year. The way we're supposed to look about at the Jewish people is, you know, maybe I know somebody who has some words in their personality. I have a word or two myself, and God should just look upon all of us with his, with his grace and benevolence. And, I mean, it's a fascinating statement. So the exception was, there were people who were destroying Klal Yisrael. So then, we, we pull out our tough bracha. But until that point in time, why should you have such a concept? So I love, I mean, even, if, even if a person, let's say a person commits a very serious sin, and there's a, a Sanhedrin, and they're supposed to punish, okay. So they committed this sin. There are rules. We're supposed to punish. We'll punish. Doesn't mean we 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 still want to die for the person's soul, for example. Yeah, I mean it's a fast. I mean, thank you for making that comment. It's a fascinating statement about how we're supposed to look at each other. This is the exception to the rule. Al is the exception to the rule. And obviously, the vast majority of people today, 
who, we're, who we think about when we say Vala Mashiach aren't Jews. The question is, if we, in our hearts and minds, think of every, every single Jew we know in this bracha that we just discussed, because that seems to be the point, with the uh, occasional exception of people who have been in the That's a, it's an interesting challenge, you know? Thank you very much. Um, maybe a last comment if anyone has a... Yeah, I don't know. I was thinking that one of the reasons that we uh, had that last little bit about Alain, you know, after, after all these prestigious groups, you know, and let me just say it, us, by the way, might be not that we're necessarily not in those groups, but that we don't want to presume to be in those groups, and that we could get to that level. And that's, that's what we're actually praying for. We should put us in those groups, God, but lead us to that level in time, so that, in a sense, we're praying for ourselves, other people are praying for us too, and we're all praying for each other to be at that level. That's very nice. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you.